in order to reach the social amount of pollution and achieve efficiencies at the same exact time, we need to use market-based policies rather than command and control. And there are two main ways to do so under the market-based policies, either with emissions taxes or as we're going to see with some type of cap and trade. So emissions taxes, also known as Pigouvian taxes, are taxes on every unit of pollution in order to achieve the socially efficient outcome. And this will take into account that firms and corporations are different from one another's and that some firms can reduce pollution at a lower cost than others. So it does give firms the flexibility in choosing whether or not they want to clean up their pollution or do something else. So here with these emissions taxes, the governing agency, the EPA, once again, is basically going to come in and say, hey, we need to clean up some type of emissions, but in order to achieve the social outcome, we can go ahead and achieve this by issuing some type of tax. And they'll set this tax at a certain amount. And the firms at this point have a decision for themselves. If they want to go ahead and clean up their pollution, they can absolutely do so. But if they want to continue to continue pollute, then they can go ahead and pay the government this particular emissions or Peruvian tax. What is a rational firm going to do in this instance? Well, they're going to go ahead and weigh the benefits and cost. If it costs them less to actually clean up their emissions than to actually pay the tax, then they're going to go ahead and clean up emissions, reduce their pollution, because that's a smart thing for them to do. And that is the most cost-effective thing for them to go ahead and do that. However, if firms have a very high cost of actually cleaning up their pollution, then they're going to go ahead and want to go ahead and pay the Peruvian or the emissions tax instead. So with this end, the firms are going to clean up pollution all the way up to where their cost of cleaning up is exactly equal to the amount of the tax. And once their cleanup cost is greater than the tax, then they're just going to go ahead and say, okay, I'll just go ahead and pay that tax. And if this is successfully implemented, we can reach the socially optimal amount of pollution, essentially this point E that we saw under the command and control. And this is going to be more efficient because we don't need any knowledge of the abatement cost involved, and it gives the firms the flexibility in choosing what they want to do. So it does create efficiencies. It just gives them a little bit more flexibility, and we like to see these type of policies being taken place within the economy. The most sort of traditional way nowadays in order to achieve this, rather than, through, rather than through these taxes, is something known as marketable or tradable permits, something known as cap and trade. And this is going to take the Coase theorem into effect quite prominently. A regulatory body sets a maximum allowable quantity allowed, typically called the cap, and issues permits granting the right to pollute a certain amount. So basically a governing agency says we need to clean up pollution and in order to reach a social amount possible, we need to go ahead and issue some type of permits. And they're going to limit the amount of these permits. And these permits, if, if it's held by a firm or corporation, it gives them the right to pollute. However, if you don't hold on to these permits, that means you actually do have to clean up your pollution. And these permits can be bought and sold on the free market. So we can either give the firms uh, sort of control over the permits right away, or we can have some type of auction where the firms and corporations bid on them. So this is exactly why these permits are called cap and trade. And this is what exactly the international countries nowadays, they do follow in order to clean up their emissions, this cap and trade. It's under the Kyoto Protocol. It's under the Paris Agreement uh, that the United States was a part of, but no longer. But if we want to clean up emissions and pollution at all, we will be using this cap and trade. So let's go ahead and see exactly how the cap and trade methodology actually works for us. And we take a look at two firms in this instance, just for simplicity. We have Firm X and Firm Y. And the government wants to clean up pollution up to a certain amount using cap and trade. So let's go ahead and lay out the information and foundations for this. Here, cap and trade. So with cap and trade, we have two firms, and suppose that they're each producing 10 tons of pollution. So first of all, we have two firms, X and Y, and each of these firms produce 10 tons tons of pollution. So each producing 10 tons of pollution, 10 tons of pollution. So here we want to go ahead and say the government wants to limit the amount of pollution by half. So government wishes to limit pollution. Government wishes to limit pollution, wishes to limit pollution by 10 tons. 
by 10 tons. And in order to achieve their particular goal, they want to use cap and trade. And they're going to go ahead and give the marketable permits and give them to a firm X initially. So they decide to use marketable permits, decide to use marketable permits, marketable permits, and give them to firm X and gives them to firm X. Remember that under the Coast Arab, it doesn't matter who has the initial property rights, we will still be allowed to get the same social outcome in the end. We can easily give the permits to firm Y or share them equally, but we will still always be able to reach a socially optimum. We just have to have a clearly defined property right here. So here we have two curves. We have the demand curve and we have the supply curve. So because firm Y doesn't have any of these permits at all, they're the ones that are going to be demanding these particular firms. So a market emerges for these permits. So supply and demand analysis. The demand curve that we see right here, demand curve, which is firm Y, DY, represents firm Y's demand, represents firm Y's, firm Y's demand for permits for permits, while SX, while SX represents firm X's willingness, firm X's willingness, willingness to sell them, to sell permits. So here we have supply and demand analysis. Firm X has all 10 of these unit uh, of these permits. Remember that in order to pollute, you need to hold onto one of these permits, but we can absolutely go ahead and trade these permits for some type of money. So a competitive market is going to emerge for these particular permits. And as you can see right here, exactly the demand for these permits by firm Y, where it intersects the supply of these permits for firm X, this intersection tells us the equilibrium price and the equilibrium amount of these permits that are going to be traded on the free market. So there is a competitive market that emerges here. So with cap and trade, it exactly goes along the methodology that we described. A competitive market, competitive market emerges for these permits. So competitive market for permits emerges, emerges. And when this happens, we have an equilibrium price of $300. With an equilibrium price, equilibrium price equal to P equals to 300. So when we have this, we know exactly what the equilibrium quantity is going to be as well. Firm Y is going to be buying seven of these particular permits because because it probably is going to be cheaper for them to buy these permits in order to pollute than to clean up the pollution up to that particular amount. So here, Firm Y, Firm Y buys seven permits, buy seven permits. So in total, they're going to spend $2,100. So for $2,100, $2,100, that's where $300 per permit times the seven, seven permits that they buy. And because they hold onto these seven permits, they're allowed to pollute seven tons. So and pollutes seven tons. So what do they do? That means they clean up three tons of their pollution. So clean up three tons. How about on the other side of the market with Firm X? So Firm X, what do they do? They sell seven of these permits to Firm Y. So sell seven permits, seven permits. And when they sell these seven permits, they receive this $2,100 payment. So they receive, receive $2,000. $100. And they can use this $2,100 to do whatever they want. They can use it for their own business operations. They can go ahead and use it to clean up their own pollution as well. They were just lucky enough to get the permits for themselves. So therefore, they get $2,100 payment from firm Y. And because they sold seven permits, they still have three of them on hand. That tells them that they're going to pollute three times. So and pollutes three times tons. So here that tells us that they have to clean up seven tons. So clean up seven tons of pollution. So it's probably easier for them to go ahead and clean up the seven tons of pollution because they receive some type of payment from firm Y and also their costs may be a little bit lower. And when this happens, are we able to achieve what the government wants? And the answer is yes. 
The government wanted to limit pollution by 10 tons, and this is exactly what we see here. Firm Y cleans up 3 tons, Firm X cleans up 7 tons, therefore we are able to reach a social amount of pollution using cap and trade, using this market-based policy. And we're essentially letting the free market decide what happens here, where the competitive market decides everything, and using the ideas of the Coase theorem. And this is a very, very efficient way for a lot of countries nowadays to go ahead and clean up their pollution by trading and selling selling these particular permits. And as we've said before, we do want to go ahead and use these market-based policies, either the Peruvian taxes or with cap and trade, because of the major advantages it brings over the sort of command and control. Number one, it creates efficiencies. Creates efficiencies. Before, there was very little flexibility in terms of cleaning up pollution with command and control, but now it does create these type of efficiencies because the firms are given the choice on what they want to clean up as well as they have some type of flexibility there. So it creates efficiencies. The second advantage that we bring right here is there's very little knowledge needed of abatement costs. So it creates efficiencies and no knowledge, no knowledge, of abatement cost is needed. Of abatement costs is needed. Is needed. We needed the idea of the abatement cost under command and control, but with these market-based policies, we don't need that at all. So the advantages we'll put here in parentheses of market-based policies. Market-based policies. So why we should be following these market-based policies rather than the command and control. So hopefully this gives you a better idea of what countries do nowadays in order to clean up the pollution. Unfortunately, the U.S. isn't going to be part of the Kyoto Protocol or the Paris Agreement because we really don't care about the environment for some strange reason. But this is exactly the sort of foundations of cap and trade and how countries nowadays can go ahead and trade permits in order to pollute and clean up their emissions levels.